right. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, hello to old friends and new friends. Thank you for showing up this morning. Hi. Um, I guess it's fair to say that choiceless awareness is the epicenter, as it were, of uh, Krishnamurti's teaching, insights, uh, and um, packaged around that or supporting that uh in my view is uh also uh the mirror of a late relationship as he called it uh, the art of listening seeing and learning so choiceless awareness um uh is a is the is the um, result if i can use that word of all of the um other insights that he brought and he often talked about them in different ways at different times he said quite a lot about choiceless awareness um, and what i have done today is created a matrix as it were of his insights because in speaking about this subject it's best to use his own words as much as possible and I can throw in a little bit of my own take on these things, and you can as well later on, but uh, we're going to uh, be uh, looking at what Krishnamurti himself said. So I've t uh, titled this first session, Approaching Choiceless Awareness, because really all we can do in one morning is approach it. So we begin with the question, what is awareness without choice? How do we approach what Krishnamurti calls choiceless awareness without getting entangled in language? Now I bring this up because um, choiceless awareness is actually wordless. And the word choiceless can be very confusing to an awful lot of people. Uh, this phrase, choiceless awareness, so far as I've been able to determine, uh, is original with Krishnamurti. Um, back in the 1930s, he was using this phrase. And I, uh, maybe someone else can find out, but I have not been able to find this word, this phrase uh, earlier. Uh, silent awareness, loving awareness all kinds of things with the word awareness, but not choiceless. So now this is my um, way of putting uh, together the way I have come to see this. Choiceless awareness is wordless. It is a silent observation of what is. It's seeing and listening without the filter of thought. So to talk about what it is, is challenging because language can take us only so far. Only a direct experience of choiceless, of choiceless awareness can make it fully understandable. So with that caveat, <laughs> we'll continue. So Krishnamurti uh, puts it this way, through awareness, through choiceless observation, which is possible only when in the mind there is space to observe, every form of conditioning is dissolved. Now this is a very big insight. It's a very big statement. Um, so he also uses the phrase choiceless observation and only possible when there is enough space in the mind to actually see, to observe. So it's not loaded with thinking when that occurs. And in that moment or moments, all of our conditioning is dissolved, he says. So I went and found things in all different places to try to put this matrix together. He says, let's begin with a very simple thing to be aware. What does it mean? I'm aware of the size of this hall, the lights in it, the shape of it, the height of it, 
and I'm aware also of the colors worn by the people sitting here, their faces, how they look, how they smile with their glasses, and so on and so on. I'm aware. Then I begin to say to myself, I like, I don't like. This is nice, this is not nice. I'm aware with choice. I say, that's a nice color or not a nice color. And so choice begins. Judgment, criticism, division, all the things that the mind is doing while we encounter a situation. He says, that's a fact that is going on all the time, not only outwardly, but also inwardly. He asks, can I look, be aware, without choice, without choice of any kind? Of course, I have to choose between this coat and that coat or something else physically, but inwardly, can I look at anything, be aware of anything without choice? So um, here we go. For example, now I'm sure instantly the word appeared, squirrel, cute, not cute, a pest, a friend, whatever may have popped into your mind when you see this image or when you see something like this in the natural world. So naming, that is usually the first thing or one of the first things we do. This seems to be how we know me and not me. So we're choosing by naming. We look in one direction out there, generally, the cave, the mountain, the sky, the other. Krishnamurti says, when I watch this process, when I observe it, that is just the beginning of awareness. So at least I'm there, as it were, and the brain isn't completely running the show and I'm asleep. A waking sleep. He continues, I observe you and you observe me. I look at you and you look at me. Can you look at me without the word me? Without your prejudice, your like and dislike? Can you look at me and can I look at you without this interpreting process? So I made a note here to myself, uh, um, the interpreting process is based on the story of me versus you. We think in words, words that are endlessly generated by thought about ourselves and others. And therefore, we're constantly choosing this over that. He says, do you see that a mind which is a slave to words is incapable of looking, observing, feeling, seeing. Can the mind break down the conditioning imposed by words? And of course, these words uh, are directed outwardly towards someone else or to, to something or to uh, something that annoys us outside, but also if these are directed inwardly to ourselves. And um, can the mind break down the conditioning imposed by words? So I thought I'd just pause here for a moment because Krishnamurti does make a distinction between uh, he calls it ordinary awareness, and sometimes he calls it superficial awareness. 
and choiceless awareness or observation without the word. So these are my words, the experience of the world and other people through our five senses and the automatic interpreting process that is fueled by memory, tradition, gender, race, family history, and all the rest of our conditioning is superficial awareness. And we're usually not aware that it's even occurring. We're on automatic pilot, as it were. In choiceless awareness, the mind's capacity to observe without judgment, naming opinion, like or dislike, or past or future. It's a moment to moment awareness of what is. So he says, observe, watch your own mind when you are listening to what is being said, then you will learn. All relationship is a mirror in which the mind can discover its own operations. And as you know, the mirror of a relationship is really the, you could say the cornerstone of understanding myself and understanding how my mind works in relationship with other people in the world. So back to this choice. I see you, and in watching you, looking at you, I form opinions. You have hurt me, you have deceived me, you have been cruel to me, or you have said things and flattered me. And consciously or unconsciously, all this remains in my mind. I think we can all relate to that. To see in the mirror of relationship exactly what is taking place, there must be choiceless awareness. And in that very perception of what is, there is freedom from what is. Now, there is never a uh, how in any of this. It's turning inward and looking and listening when I'm, uh, when I'm having an exchange with someone. So, in a very clear statement, awareness is a state of choiceless attention. So obviously attention and awareness are two sides of the same coin, if not, you know, joined together at the hip, you can't have one without the other. Um, so everything begins with our attention, with giving our attention to what's in front of us and inside us. So here's a moment for an awareness interval to take a breath. You know, mostly we're so unconscious that we breathe. <laughs> it's automatic. So it's a pause to remember, simply to remember the breath and the effect it has on the body and mind when I remember my breath. It's simply giving attention to this marvelous thing called breathing. And that can be extended into our relationships. So now I would like to uh, bring a question that someone asked Krishnamurti into this space. The question, is there any way you can explain 
the process of awareness of becoming aware. And the response is very simple. Be aware of those flowers. Be aware of your neighbors sitting next to you. Be aware of sounds, people's words, how they are dressed, what they look like, without condemning, without justifying, without choosing, just be aware. I can also be aware of my motives, of my habits of thought. The mind can be aware of its limitations, of its own conditioning, and there is the inquiry as to whether the mind can ever be free from its own conditioning. To say that the mind can or cannot be free from its conditioning is still a part of its conditioning. But to observe that conditioning without saying either is a furthering of awareness, awareness of the whole process of thinking. So to me, this suggests that it's possible by bringing attention into my thinking process and my way of relating to others to deepen awareness, to become far more acquainted with the whole process of how I think, what's at the root of my thinking and how it affects my everyday existence. Krishnamurti says, all human problems arise from this extraordinarily complex living center, which is the me. And a man or woman who would uncover its subtle ways has to be choicelessly observant. And if you say you can't do that, then be aware of why you can't. What prevents you from observing without thought, from being choicelessly aware? And of course, this is repeated. To be aware of your conditioning, you must watch it choicelessly. See the fact of conditioning and not give an opinion or judgment about the fact. In other words, look at the fact without thought. Then there is an awareness, a state of attention without a center, without frontiers, where the known doesn't interfere. It's not easy. <laughs> um, and in understanding its own self-centered activities, the mind comes upon this state of awareness, which is choiceless, and such a mind is then capable of complete silence, stillness. So it seems, if I can use the word portal, that choiceless awareness Awareness without the word is the door, as it were, to a complete and total stillness, out of which something, uh, perhaps the imme immeasurable, can emerge. I put a few in, in here since we're talking about awareness to um, <clears throat> just take a moment again. Breathe. Rest. Relax. I personally have found a relationship between relaxation and attention. I find that it's very difficult to give my attention, let alone my full attention, if I'm tense. Now I know these are images 
and there's beauty in these images, some of them. And so I put this one here for us to see if we can see how it's affecting us, what kind of thought may emerge and watch that thought. without judgment or any kind of commentary. Simply watch the thought that emerges when one sees an image, whether it's on a screen, on your cell phone, or in the natural world, or in a grocery store. The image of a mother and child Maybe this is something we see in our own life, or it evokes a memory of some kind. Maybe we see something like this when we're out and about. But to observe it without words, to be quiet with it. The same with this, because so much of our conditioning, as we know, comes from <laughs> the minute we uh, were born, if not before. Um, the conditioning, the history, the relationship with our parents, all of it is in the head, and it's a truly a uh, feat of attention to recognize that. And so to connect it with that, Krishnamurti says, a tree is not merely the leaf or the flower or the fruit. It is also the branch, the trunk. It is everything that goes to make up the whole tree. Likewise, awareness is of the total process of the mind, not just of one particular segment of that process. And he continues, but the mind cannot understand the total process of itself if it condemns or justifies any part, or identifies itself with the pleasurable and rejects the painful. When one has a fixed point from which one observes, there is no understanding in one's observation. This is why I think when, if we are engaged and we are in a uh, complete grip of our own opinion, there is no space to see anything other than my own opinion. He says, there is no mystery at all about awareness. It is infinitely practical and applicable to everyday existence. The difficulty is that you never look directly at the fact. You look only at the values and opinions associated with the fact, and this prevents you from seeing the fact. So awareness is a state of choiceless attention. It has tremendous meaning if you're aware choicelessly, because then your thinking becomes highly clear. You are no longer persuaded or influenced by your own motives or the motives of society.
there's freedom in that. Okay, again. So this is a kind of uh, another way of looking at it. This is my words. Choiceless awareness reveals the content of me with wordless observation. This occurs in listening, seeing, and learning in the mirror of relationship. Krishnamurti's, you know, way of helping us understand what we are. And again, such a mind is then capable of complete silence, stillness. And then the immeasurable may arise. Now, um, I just put something together. I don't, you know, it's simply uh, a suggestion. I'm just calling it the possibility of choiceless awareness in everyday life when I have a conversation with someone. The first thing, of course, is to bring my attention to that person. Watch, listen, and observe what is being said without judgment or praise. Give my attention to liking or not liking when it comes up. Watch your own inner and outer talking in the same way. You know, listening to myself talk. Because when I said that, I just now listened to myself talk. So this is an integrated observation of the whole conversation I'm having with someone. And then if there is enough attention, there can be a pause, a breath. Because if something's said that I want to respond to that I don't agree with, then then maybe the mind and the emotional reaction or body can slow down and avoid a conditioned reaction if I continue watching without condemnation. But there is going to be a response. If attention has been sustained, my response is part of the observation. If my attention or uh, choiceless awareness is forgotten, then don't judge what, what happened or what did not happen. It's the learning from it that matters. Uh, one of those three pillars, the art of learning, listening, and seeing. So I don't know if this makes any sense, but this was something that I just wrote yesterday. So Krishnamurti says, through choiceless awareness, I begin to see myself as I actually am, the totality of myself. Being watchful from moment to moment, all of its thoughts, its feelings, its reactions, unconscious as well as conscious. The mind is constantly discovering the significance of its own activities, which is self-knowledge. When one is deeply conscious or aware, there is no remnant or hidden unconscious movement. There is no division between the outer and the inner, the inner and the outer. Something like this often happens or can happen in nature, of course, when we're momentarily surprised by a beautiful sunrise or sunset. 
uh, everything stops for a moment. And the mind, the thinking, all of it's gone. And there is no inner and outer. There's just the attention there. And it seems to me the, um, the challenge is to bring that into my relationships with other people. To slow down, give my full attention, the generosity of attention, and uh, listen without that filter between me and you, if possible and not feel uh, dejected when it doesn't work out that way. So another way of saying all of this is the emptying of me is choiceless awareness. Only when the mind is not self-concerned Is there a possibility of bliss? To be choicelessly aware means to be sensitive, alive to the things about one to nature, to people, to color, to trees, to the environment, to the whole structure, the whole thing, to be aware outwardly of all that's happening and to be aware of what is happening inside, simultaneously. And that brings me to... uh, (laughs) It's a favorite of mine. I absolutely uh, love this uh, statement by Kay. When I understand myself, I understand you. And out of that understanding comes love. Okay.